Um, it's such a pleasure and a delight to be here. And I want to thank Brown Bread for the invitation. And it's always lovely to see Jo, not just for her delightful self, but also, and you're going to have to forgive me for this, Jo, because you're so like your mum. <laughs> Um, who's someone I've known for many years and am very fond of. And it's not just that you look alike, it's that you sound so alike. You have the same manner of speaking and you've got the same laugh. And it's lovely and it's a bit uncanny. And I'm saying this not because I want to embarrass you, Joe, but that's quite fun. Um, I want, it's because it's what I want to talk about tonight. I want to talk about inheritance. And now, I'm from a female family. My mother had two daughters. My sister and I both had two daughters. My two daughters have each had two daughters. We're doing our bit to write the gender imbalance that's grown to 107 male births to 100 female worldwide and much more in China and India. But us, we're onto it. We're all girls. So I know a bit about being female in New Zealand over the past few decades. My mother was born in 1910. And what did I inherit from her, apart from the stumpy legs and the freckles? Well, principally, the notion of a vocation. A woman needed a vocation, not a job, though that you did need that as well. You needed your own bank book, your own income, but something that represented your own particular gifts and expressed them. She was a nurse. A trained nurse, she always added that bit, a trained nurse, until she was 35, when she met my father, who'd been wounded at El Alamein, married him and had me. And in 1947, that meant she had to give up her profession, and she missed it desperately all her life. Her nursing mates, her own income, the status conferred by the veil and the starched uniform. And we knew this. She'd never complained, and on the contrary, she cared for us very devotedly, me and my sister and my father, when the wounds reduced him to excruciating paralysis. And the way she interpreted this, because he was a tough patient, but the way she interpreted this, because she was devoutly religious, was that this was all meant to be. He was ill, she was a nurse, this was her vocation. Now, I'm not religious, but I learned from her that you have to truly value what you do. And I'm so very grateful to have been able to do it. The other thing she left me with was some sayings by which I've lived my entire life. One was, you will never regret a swim. <laughs> <laughs> and it's true, you never do. And don't sit on cold concrete. I've never had piles. Um, but the one that she told me that really struck home when it was when I was fretting over something and getting depressed about something, and she said to me, Fiona, our family cope. As if something like coping was passed down genetically along with the freckles and the stumpy legs. And I found it deeply reassuring. It's something I've passed on to my daughters. We cope. My daughters have taught me other things. The main one was that I'm a, I'm a mammal. The total startlement of having their bodies moving about under my skin and the overwhelming astonishment of birth, that's worth it to be female, just to have that. I wasn't a job, I wasn't a brain, I was at one with the cat and all the other billions of animals worldwide <laughs> suckling our young and purring. Now, as a functioning mother, I was total rubbish. My main feeling, looking back at that period of my life, is sheer relief that I got away with it. <laughs> they survived my culinary experiments, the leaden loaves of the enchanted broccoli forest phase, the squid sambal of the Indonesian period, and they stayed safe somehow when I parked the pram on a slope and it tipped out. Um, <laughs> And when I dropped them off at the wrong address in the mad scramble to get to work on time. And later on, the upheavals of a divorce, when their mother suddenly transformed, not as she would put it, 
into a noble soul bravely embarking on a midlife journey of self-realization, but as one of them put it with absolute devastating adolescent accuracy, a ditz who just wanted to put on short black skirts and chat up men. <laughs> Yet somehow everyone's sharing tonight, so that's my... <laughs> I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm being encouraged to do it. Yet somehow, my daughters have turned out fine. They're clever, they're kind, they're much better mothers than I ever was, and they're funny. And yes, we sound alike when we laugh. And now there are the granddaughters. They teach me to see everything afresh. Grandma, says one of them, why are you drawing on your face? And I'm applying the mascara and the lipstick that I've applied for 50 years, not very well either. And I step back and think, hang on a minute, why am I drawing on my face? <laughs> After all, they like it just as it is. They like pleating the wrinkles on what they call my tortoise neck. Um, and they ask me to make my old tortoise face. Um, <laughs> um, <laughs> My aging makes them laugh. Now, I don't like aging. I hate it. I don't like my friends getting sick or dwindling or dying. And after years of casually writing fictional deaths, I'm having to come to terms with the reality. I don't like it one bit. But my granddaughters force me to think beyond that, um, to think what they're going to inherit when I'm not around. It's unbearable in some ways, a world without orangutans and polar bears suckling their young. It seems such a dreadful, lonely place, and it's made me political in a way I haven't been since I was marching about in my 20s to stop a war. So I sign the petitions, I write the submissions, I join a party, and it's possibly pointless, but I so want them to be able to swim in a clean river, because as we all know, you'd never regret a swim. <laughs> I've been so lucky, a, working, a girl from a working class family, born at a time and a place that gave me free health so I didn't die of scarlet fever, and free education from kindergarten to cap and gown, first in my family to go to a university. My great-great-grandmother signed with a cross, but I've been able to make my living as a writer. Not because I'm particularly gifted, but because an entire generation of people like me, other girls, other women, were suddenly able to read and had the time and their own money to spend on books. The things that have made me are birth control, feminism, and the welfare state. That's what's given me my life. My most recent writing job has been editing a selection of the 25 best poems published in New Zealand in 2018 for the Wellington Institute of Modern Letters. Now, I was born in 1947, the same year as Landfall, the country's premier literary journal. When I was beginning to read poems and trying to write some myself, entire issues of that magazine had no work by women at all. 1963, four quarterly issues, three poems in total by women. 1964, four issues, three dozen poems by men, five by women. The silence was deafening. In 2018, there were around 2,000 poems published last year, and I'd say about 80% were published by women. We've lived through a revolution. That's just a little thing, but it's a little sign, a telltale, We've lived through a revolution, and we still are. There's no such thing as post-feminism. It's total nonsense. It hasn't looked like a revolution with barricades and guns. In fact, what it looks like is this room. It looks like us. We've inherited this, and it's what we're going to pass on to the children coming after us, along with the way we laugh. Thank you.